At the midway point of the 2019 season, trouble suddenly struck the teams of Joe Gibbs Racing and Extreme Concepts Incorporated. Their primary sponsor, IK9, abruptly missed a payment and the decals and banners on their cars and haulers came off just as things were starting to get underway at the July Daytona race. However, just a few hours later, the team scrambled to put the logos back up where they belonged. As it turned out, the drivers slated to start the races there at the track in the Xfinity and the Cup Series, Jeffrey Earnhardt, had backed out of his contract with IK9 out of the blue. IK9 is a dog training service that prepares service dogs for police, other official contractors, and the disabled. With that pretty slim market, it wouldn't have been too surprising if IK9 missed their payments due to lack of funds. But as soon as Jeffrey Earnhardt skipped town, they were good, and made their payment. What had happened was, Jeffrey had signed with JGR and XCI to run races for them in the top two divisions on the promise that he'd be promoted to a full-time cup ride in 2020. But when Christopher Bell's name started getting slung around for that, Jeffrey backed out and dropped all of his sponsorship obligations immediately. Now with no driver, XCI and IK9 understandably halted their plans. JGR scrambled to find replacement drivers, but the damage had been done. XCI ceased its cup program after just one start at Talladega just a few months prior, and IK9 massively scaled down its sponsorship obligations for 2020. This time a driver, not a sponsor, had torpedoed an organization, a reversal of the usual course of events. But while we're on the topic, let's explore some of the worst sponsors, team owners, and track promoters in NASCAR history. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legend. <laughs> <laughs> I had you go in there for a second, didn't I? No, but for real though. This video is supported by NordVPN and viewers like you via Patreon. Thank you guys so much. Sponsorships are the lifeblood of NASCAR. Without them, we wouldn't be able to fund the big advancements we've made in the sport. We'd still be stuck on dirt and racing would look like this. Well, I don't know. That actually looks pretty cool to me. Anyway, the point is we're able to put on races across the country and hurdle around in state-of-the-art facilities at ridiculous speeds because big companies want to get their name out there and hood space on a mean-looking V8 monster is pretty tempting real estate. But in everyone's haste to sell off body panels and naming rights to the highest bidder, sometimes ne'er-do-wells slip through the cracks trying to get clout or just some free advertising. Sponsorships are built on trust, and unfortunately, some people come along and abuse that trust for their own ends. And then more often than not, just bafflingly drop off the face of the earth shortly after they've been caught. Mark Martin almost had his entire career nixed in his rookie season after Apache Stove agreed to sponsor him full-time in 1982 and then just never paid him a dime. You might think that a wood-burning stove company stepping up and spending tens of thousands of dollars to sponsor a NASCAR Cup Series team was odd, but they had sponsored Terry Labonte in his rookie campaign just three years prior. Mark, an owner-driver in a partnership with Bud Reeder, took the deal and then once the checks bounced, scrambled to find funding taking money from anyone who wanted some cheap advertising. Midway through the season, Mark had everyone he knew begging him to drop out of the series and cut his losses. His debts were mounting and he was going to end up broke, but Mark stubbornly continued on. If he could just win the Rookie of the Year award, then the cash prize at the end of the year would pay for everything, and he'd be good. However, after a late season collapse, failing to finish five of the last eight races, Jeff Bodine pulled away and ended up with the check and the ticket to the year-end banquet at the Waldorf Astoria. Now severely in debt and with no other sponsors knocking on the door, Mark sold off his share of the team and started over from scratch. In 1983, he signed with Jim Stacy and drove for him for the first seven races of the season, before parting ways with him, too. Why? Well, Jim Stacy wasn't paying him either. Mark Martin quit his dreams of being a NASCAR star after the 1984 season and dropped back to the Midwestern-centered ASA series. But, as we all know, he'd be back in a big way once the 90s rolled around. So let's talk about Jim J.D. Stacy. By 1983, the California real estate mogul had become quite notorious for just not paying people he worked with. In 1981, he had bought Rod Osterlin's number two team with star driver and defending champion Dale Earnhardt. However, Dale was the first to get bit by JD's nefarious ways and defected over to Richard Childress Racing after that. You probably know how well that turned out for him. After that, JD went to a two-car operation and proceeded to have a revolving door of drivers big and small come through his shop. Jim Sauter, Joe Rutman, Morgan Shepard, Tim Richmond, and many others. Some got paid, some didn't. Okay, so he was a reckless car owner. Big whoop, right? Well, that wasn't the only way he managed to screw people over. He had a penchant, almost an addiction, to sponsoring as many cars as he could in any given race. He just loved seeing his name plastered everywhere. To be fair, I mean, who doesn't though, right? 
In the 1982 Daytona 500, he sponsored no less than seven entries, and sometimes he would bring that count as high as eight. But as the season dragged on, he became more and more spotty with his payments, and eventually found himself in legal trouble. As it turned out, the real estate market over in California was imploding, and he was losing money fast. Honest team owners like Harry Rainier, Junie Donlevy, and Billy Hagen, who had been fixtures in the sport for over a decade, found themselves struggling to meet their basic payments after JD's checks bounced. And they'd struggle for the rest of the decade and eventually bow out by the time the 90s rolled around. Everywhere he went, J.D. Stacy seemed to kill everything he touched. He sold his team before the 1984 season kicked off and dipped out of the sport entirely almost as suddenly as he had come in. While a bad sponsorship deal can kill a career in the cradle, it can also send a legendary driver into retirement well before his time. Darrell Waltrip had unknowingly won his final race of his career at the Southern 500 in 1992 and struggled to keep pace with the field as an owner-driver throughout the 90s. At the end of the 1997 season, his longtime sponsor Western Auto had backed out and he was looking for a new one to foot the bill. Speedblock, a brand of fast-setting concrete, stepped up and DW quickly agreed to their terms in a handshake deal. He made the first five races of 1998 sporting their colors, but then he found out that it's always better to have a multi-million dollar sponsorship deal in riding. Speedblock never sent him a single check. Now in six-figure debt and his best years behind him, Daryl sold his beloved team and all of his assets to Tyler Beverly, who merged it with International Sports Management, another team Beverly had bought. But unbeknownst to either of them, they had just inflamed the tensions in the infamous Tabasco fiasco from the previous entry in this series. Eventually, in a cruel twist of fate, Tyler Beverly's new team, Tyler Jet Motorsports, tapped Daryl Waltrip to drive what were essentially his old cars. However, going into the 2000 season, Tyler needed a new driver and a new sponsor. Johnny Benson was selected, and Lycos, an early internet search engine signed up to sponsor the endeavor. Part of the deal was about five million dollars in Lycos bucks, which was basically free banner ads on Lycos's website. But how Lycos determined the ad rates was pretty fishy, and as it turned out they just weren't displaying those ads they had promised at all. Tyler Beverly had named his race team Tyler Jet Motorsports because he ran a jet sales company and was hoping the ads would drive more business his way. Tyler eventually sued, but before a settlement could be reached, he sold off the team to MB2 Motorsports, who were more interested in racing than selling commercial aircraft. And they actually got Johnny Benson his very first career win. The Lycos debacle ended up being the very first nail in the coffin for Tyler Beverly, as he was brought under investigation for money laundering in 2004. In actuality, Tyler had never gotten enough money from Lycos to fund the race team, and was actually laundering money from his jet sales company to finance the whole operation. He was convicted, sent to prison, got out, and then got bopped again in 2017 for tax evasion. Once a grifter, always a grifter, I guess. Alright, so shady sponsors are bad for teams, no surprise there. But what about sponsors that are great for teams but screw over their customers? Let's talk a minute about Advocare. Advocare is a multi-level marketing company that primarily sold nutritional supplements. Now, multi-level marketing means that somebody at the top sells the products to people down the line. Then in turn, those people sell more stuff to people lower in the line, and a portion of all of the money from successive sales is funneled upwards towards the top. So people at the top profit more than the people down on the lower rungs. Well, that sounds a bit like a pyramid scheme, but for legal reasons, I can't actually call these companies pyramid schemes. However, I mean, just take a look at their business model. What do you call a business model with this shape? Advocare had sponsored a few race teams, NCAA basketball, and had even gotten an endorsement from Drew Brees, who touted it as a great opportunity for people to earn additional income. However, the Federal Trade Commission thought that Advocare was just a little bit too close to a pyramid scheme for their tastes, and they fined them for $150 million and told them to completely revamp their business from the ground up. The thing that had really gotten them in hot water was when they went around selling their service as being able to generate, quote, unlimited income. Considering that the money that currently exists on planet Earth right now is finite, that's one hell of a thing to say, and they paid dearly for it. To my knowledge, they haven't sponsored anyone in NASCAR since. With all of these sketchy sponsors floating around, you might be wondering why nobody is around sounding the alarm on these jerks before they actually do the damage. But NASCAR and the NASCAR Media Corps actually have a sort of gentleman's agreement to keep their hands off of sponsors, so as to not scare off any of the good actors. To be fair, it would only be a matter of time until somebody jumped the gun and said something about a company that just was wasn't true, which is why everybody was so tight-lipped about the IK9 situation while it was developing. So let's talk about the NASCAR Media Corps. Back in the days when old media was king and the only game in town, the Media Corps used to consist of hundreds of beat reporters traveling across the country with NASCAR, who worked for a variety of publications ranging from NASCAR Scene to the New York Times. Nowadays though, with new media taking the spotlight, the Corps has shrunk to just a few dozen or so. 
And with accurate information at a premium, a journalist's reputation and trust is everything. If even one reporter goofs, then they threaten the legitimacy of all the others. So they have a tendency to jettison reporters from their in-group who don't mind their P's and Q's. Professionalism is everything in these circles. But with new media crowding out the old way, some new players inevitably come on the scene and threaten the trustworthiness of the whole operation. And that gets us to the 2020 Las Vegas media meltdown. After the season opener at Daytona had been delayed until Monday night, teams and media alike were exhausted when they rolled into Las Vegas on the other side of the country just four days later. A new player in the market, Motor Racing Insider, has sent an envoy of theirs to do social media for them on location, fellow YouTuber Joseph Lombard, who had signed on with them in late 2019. However, when Joseph was just starting to get settled into his new gig on Saturday, his phone started blowing up. Someone had looked into Motor Racing Insider and discovered that the articles on their site were plagiarized. And I don't just mean one or two of them, but all of them. And it wasn't like they had just stolen a few paragraphs here and there either. They had straight up copy-pasted the entire articles. Everything on their site was ripped off from other news sources. Joseph was their social media guy, not a writer. But since he was their only representative at the track, he took the heat nonetheless. Reporters and Twitter users alike hammered him online. But after it was revealed that he himself had done nothing wrong, they backed off. The head of MRI took to Twitter to calm everybody down, saying that they were just an aggregator site, not a news site. But aggregators post links to articles. They don't just copy-paste the whole thing and leave a link down at the bottom in the small print. Plus, there was a parody account going around making things way worse. Joseph, who was understandably furious, tried to contact his boss, but found he had changed his name on Facebook and was being very dodgy all around, deflecting any blame sent his way. MRI went dark shortly thereafter. Now, some people have tried to blame Joseph Lombard for this, saying that he should have looked into his employer more, but I disagree. It is perfectly reasonable to assume that your employer isn't, you know, breaking the frickin' law. It's not your job as an employee to sniff out the inner workings of the business you work for to make sure everything's on the up and up. I mean, nobody's ever taken a job at FedEx and said, yeah, the job's great, but before I sign on the dotted line, can I inspect a few of the packages to make sure you guys aren't knowingly transporting illegal drugs? Oh shit, that one actually happened. Okay, so maybe you should just assume that your employers are all thieving bastards because, let's face it, they probably are. But that's not all from the Las Vegas media meltdown that year. During a rain delay on Saturday for the Xfinity race, the rumors began circulating among NASCAR Media Corps members that some other YouTuber with media credentials was going around the garage acting very unprofessional. Well, that just won't do. With these new media personalities often being the gateway for newer fans entering the sport, unprofessionalism affects everyone down the line. Speculation is that it was Darian Gilliam, aka Black Flags Matter, going around the garage trying to get NASCAR drivers to rub a little Buddha statue of his for good luck. Very unprofessional, Darian. I don't know, that seems pretty innocuous to me. Then again, I've been in this YouTube scene for more than a decade, and unless somebody's abusing their kids or faking their own death for views, I consider it a pretty slow news day to be honest with you. I give Darian a pass on this one. But that wasn't the last of the chicanery from Las Vegas that weekend. After the main event in the media center, somebody asked a very unprofessional question of the race winner, Joey Logano. What was this question? No one knew at the time. All the media corps members won't say anything on Twitter. Everyone's being super professional and tight-lipped about it. However, Jim Utter speculates that it might have been a Barstool Sports stunt. Jeff Gluck thinks that it might have been a YouTube thing. Both of them tweet this without any evidence backing this up. Well, that sounds kind of just unprofessional, guys. When Utter is called out on it, well, he doesn't seem to care. An odd thing to say for somebody who says they care about professionalism so much. Barstool Sports is an organization that's pretty new to the whole media core thing, and they're in a unique position because they don't have any respect amongst their peers and don't seem to be interested in getting it either. They are self-admittedly an outlet ran for and by frat bro types that love college sports. David Portnoy, the president of Barstool Sports, has a penchant for calling people out on their BS, leading harassment campaigns, and in general just being kind of a dick. So, Portnoy was quick to have a few of his guys remind the Twitterverse about how unprofessional Jim Utter is. And as it turns out, he had a habit of towing any car that parked in his designated parking spot. One time he even had NASCAR driver Michael McDowell towed. Why did the other media members not call Utter out on this? Well, it was to maintain appearances. But Barstool just doesn't give a shit and they outed him. David Portnoy, as he so often does, led a harassment campaign against Jim Utter and honestly, they took it too far. I mean, it was kind of funny though. As it turned out, this whole fiasco wasn't a YouTube or a Barstool stunt. A guy by the name of Mark Anthony DeBello had somehow finagled media credentials, despite the fact that on his application papers he stated that he wrote for his own media company, and only has 129 subs on YouTube and no real social media presence whatsoever. So what was this horrifically unprofessional question he asked? Um, Long-term question. 
there's talk out there uh, about a 10-year plan NASCAR of NASCAR November. Um, Charlotte for the Hall of Fame here because it's obviously the gambling capital and congratulations you were five to one to win this race uh -huh. and the final race uh, a week championship series in Daytona with the um, cool part being that the championship the cup winner gets to uh, be the pole sitter for the race in February Daytona 500 your thoughts about um, Whoa. that in the long term that's it that's the whole question Jesus guys that wasn't so bad now was it I don't understand why this was such a big deal anyway or why the esteemed media corps freaked out about it and wondered who it was. I mean, he had done the same thing last year to the same driver at the same race. Did nobody catch that? That's all news to me. Only that time back in 2019 he asked, would NASCAR move to a four-stage format instead of the current three stages? Which, as it turned out, that was an idea they had been floating around amongst themselves. The man's a prophet is all I'm saying. Don't be too surprised if what he says actually comes to pass. The lesson here, folks, check your sources, stay humble, and don't park in Jim Utter's parking spot. I mean, it's not like I have to worry about that last one. I mean, I live all the way out in South Carolina. There's no way he could possibly... Wait, what's that noise? Oh, shit. Hey, hey, it's my car! Stop! That's my car! <laughs> Damn. How did Jim Utter find out where I lived and my license plate number? You know what, it must have been that time I hooked up to the free Wi-Fi at Daytona International Speedway earlier this year. Jim must have used that to track me down. If only there was some sort of virtual private network I could have used to protect myself. Well luckily, thanks to our newest supporter, NordVPN, you can do just that. With the lockdown still ongoing and people spending more time on their phones and computers than ever, it's important to keep yourself protected from various ne'er-do-wells roaming the internet. And luckily, NordVPN is here to help. If you use the affiliate link down below or use coupon code SLAPSHOES, spelled straight up with no numbers, all lowercase, you can get 70% off NordVPN. Only $3.49 a month, plus you get an additional month free. So don't gamble like I did and go ahead and get yourself some protection out there in these wild and crazy times. Also, impound fees are really expensive. Yeah, NordVPN is just way cheaper. Go with that. <laughs> So that wraps up the 2020 Las Vegas media meltdown. But what about that Twitter parody account that fanned the flames of the MRI situation? Well, right now it's pretty inactive, but still up. So let's talk about some of these NASCAR parody accounts. Most are harmless fun, but some do too good of a job portraying their real-life counterparts. Adam Stern is a highly respected NASCAR journalist, and when he says something, you can usually take it to the bank. But when Adam Slurn gives you news that's just too good to be true, it's time to double check for that blue check mark. And yes, even your boy's been slurred before, I'll admit it. These NASCAR parody accounts can trace their origins to the Twitter account Drunken Brian France. Now this guy wasn't the first to do this, but he was the most prolific in this genre. Real Brian France was the president and CEO of NASCAR from 2003 until 2018. The reason why his tenure ended then is because he got bought for driving under the influence in August of 2018, right after the sport's most popular driver won his very first race. Yikes. Now, drunken Brian France had made his account back in 2016, and at the time, rumors about real Brian France's substance abuse issues were running rampant. So when those rumors turned out to be undoubtedly true, drunken Brian France had a field day. But in the wee hours of early March 2020, drunken Brian France posted a frightening message. Real Brian France had initiated a lawsuit citing damages for mental distress caused by the parody account. In the lawsuit, drunken Brian France was doxxed as the public lawsuit has his home state and his real legal name cited, and DBF was now in some serious legal trouble. Okay, so you might be thinking, isn't drunken Brian France protected under US law? Why yes, he is, under two major pieces of legal precedence. One, it's not slander or damaging if it's true. That one's been on the books in American law since before the US even declared independence. And two, parody of a public figure is perfectly okay. In Hustler vs. Falwell in 1987, televangelist Jerry Falwell sued Hustler Magazine, yes, that Hustler Magazine, for publishing a fake interview in which Falwell allegedly talked about his favorite liquors and his first sexual experience with his mom. It was obviously satire. But Falwell didn't see it that way, and in a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court, SCOTUS ruled in a rare unanimous decision that Hustler was protected under the First Amendment, and it has remained the benchmark for law regarding parody ever since. As is typical in the midst of a lawsuit, a gag order was handed down and the information was scarce going forward about DBF. But about a month later, the two had come to a settlement. Now, the agreements of the settlement aren't known, as that's a private matter, but one thing was made immediately clear. 
Part of the settlement was that DBF would issue a public apology and deactivate his account. Now, real Brian France had no intention of ever winning the lawsuit right from the get-go. His plan was just to drag it out for so long that DBF would come to the negotiating table begging for forgiveness. Legal fees are expensive and you can only keep that up for so long. Real Brian France is still a millionaire and he can spend as much money as he damn well pleases. This is what's called a slap suit and no, I don't have anything to do with it. Slap stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation and they're pretty common among people of high standing that don't like regular folks like you and me speaking ill about them. In one famous recent example, John Oliver of the political comedy show Last Week Tonight got sued by Bob Murray after they ran a segment on Bob showcasing all of his misdeeds. Then after the lawsuit was dropped, John Oliver ran a follow-up show about slap suits and humiliated Bob again, showing that slap suits only serve to protect the powerful and harm the weak. And that's exactly what happened with DBF and real Brian France. Hey, I guess that's just another reason to use NordVPN. It'd be really hard for Brian France to track you down. Now, it would be a real shame if, say, someone with a significant following and a loyal fan base told all of their viewers to start up a bunch of fake Brian France parody accounts and flood the Twitterverse with all sorts of crazy antics. I mean, I'm not saying anything, I'm just saying there's nothing I could do to stop you if you were so inclined. Legally speaking, of course. So that about wraps up this edition of the worst liars, thieves, and lawyers to ever pop up in the NASCAR ecosystem. So long as this much money is on the line and these kinds of egos are at stake, we'll keep talking about these debacles for years to come. Until next time, I'm Slapshoes, and I'm sorry you had to watch this. Y'all take it easy.